Good afternoon. I'm Alon Confino. I teach history at the, the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, where I direct the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies. And I welcome all of you to our special event, Antisemitism in the United States. The Institute at UMass Amherst is a center of research, learning, education, and public events on the topics of its title, as well as others such as Jewish and Israeli history, human rights, and mass violent events. One key vision of the Institute has been to make it a center of study and engagement against all forms of oppression, anti-Semitism, of course, but also racism, bigotry, slavery, anti-Blackness, xenophobia, and sexual oppression, putting at the center different groups of victims at different historical times, be they Jews, Blacks, immigrants, refugees, LGBTQ, or Palestinians. Today, we gather here to discuss anti-Semitism in the United States because it has gained of late power and momentum in ways that most people, Jews and non-Jews, could not have imagined possible just a short while ago. Implicit and explicit approval of anti-Semitism is tolerated or supported now by people with serious power. These are reasons to be worried. At the same time, there are fierce debates, particularly among Jews, about what exactly constitutes anti-Semitism. At the center of these debates are Zionism and Israel and Palestine. When does critique of Israel or Zionism cross the line into anti-Semitism. These two phenomena commingle to characterize the historical condition of anti-Semitism in today's American society. To discuss this in a round table, we assembled three very distinguished voices within the Jewish community. Rabbi Jill Jacobs is the CEO of Tua the Rabbini Call of Human Rights, an organization that trains and mobilizes more than 2,300 rabbis and cantors and their communities to bring a moral voice to protecting and advancing human rights in North America, Israel, and the occupied Palestinian territories. Among her books is Where Justice Dwells, a hands-on guide to doing social justice in your Jewish community published by Jewish Lights. Lila Corwin Berman holds the Murray Friedman Chair of American Jewish History at Temple University, where she directs the Feinstein Center for American Jewish History. Her most recent book, The American Jewish Philanthropic Complex, The History of a Multi-Billion Dollar Institution, has been awarded prizes from the Organization of American Historians and the American Jewish Historical Society. And finally, Peter Beinert is a professor of journalism and political science at CUNY, editor at large of Jewish Currents, an MSNBC contributor, a fellow at the Foundation for Middle East Peace, and a frequent contributor to the New York Times. Our event will be recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel of the Institute. The event today is co-sponsored by TUA and by the Department of Jewish and Near Eastern Studies at UMass Amherst. I would like to give the floor to Professor David Mednikov, the chair of the department, to say a few brief words. And thanks, Alan. The Department of Judaic and Near Eastern Studies at UMass Amherst is an example of an increasingly rare enclave where people who study Jewish cultures and people who study the Middle East work in tandem and collaboratively to deal with difficult issues, including anti Semitism and Islamophobia in the United States. On behalf of my unit, I am grateful to Alan and the Institute and proud to co-sponsor this event. I know that this panel of influential and, and intellectuals and activists whose work I have followed 
closely for years will bring nuance and insight to a topic that is too often treated imprecisely or with a concealed political agenda. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'd like us to begin with the panelists by discussing the reality of antisemitism in America today. So I'd like I'd like to I'd like us I'd like to ask you what are the causes for the spike in antisemitism in this historical moment? Why now? Who are the agents of this antisemitism? Uh, and what are the causes of this trend that we see? Uh, perhaps we'll start with Jill, then Lila, and then Peter. Please, Jill. Thank you so much to Alone and also to David for hosting this conversation. Really glad to be here. Um, also with friends and colleagues, with both Peter and Lila, who are longtime friends and colleagues. Um, so I want to say a few very general things and then um, say some of the reasons that I think we're finding ourselves in this particular situation in this moment. So the first thing I want to say is that Troy represents more than 2,300 rabbis across the U.S. and Canada. And I just want to say, first of all, that those rabbis, what we're hearing is that they're very scared. They're scared that somebody is going to walk into their synagogue, God forbid, um, with a gun. They're scared about their communities. And I just don't want to lose sight of, of that because in a lot of the conversations that we have about anti-Semitism, where we're debating the theory and we're debating the causes and we're debating, is this anti-Semitism or is this not anti-Semitism? Sometimes it feels like we lose sight of the actual people on the ground, which is what's most important, that we wanna start with a commitment to keeping Jews safe, um, as well as keeping everybody else safe, because we know that anti-Semitism doesn't operate in a vacuum, that, an that anti-Semitism operates in concert with racism and xenophobia and transphobia and lots of other biases. So I just wanna say that first of all, that we're coming to this conversation, I think every, all of us with a commitment to making sure that Jews and all people are safe. The second thing that I wanna say, I've been doing over the last many years, probably at least more than half a decade, much more teaching and speaking about anti-Semitism than I would have dreamed um, likely earlier in my career. And um, both in Jewish communities and non-Jewish communities. And the thing that I learned over and over is that people mostly in non-Jewish communities, also in Jewish communities, have very little understanding of anti-Semitism, sometimes surprisingly little um, understanding. I'll say that um, one story that I often tell is that right after the Nazi march on Charlottesville, I was talking to a reporter at a sec a non-Jewish reporter at a secular newspaper, and she said she was really surprised by what happened. She said, because I thought that anti-Semitism went away after the Holocaust. And it was a reminder that for many people in, in the US, particularly non-Jews, there's a sense of anti-Semitism as something that comes from the past. And specifically because, um, of course, we talk a lot about the Holocaust. It's a genocide of our people in, in recent memory and historical memory. And at the same time, that means that for a lot of people, all they know about anti-Semitism is the Holocaust. So it was like, there was nothing, nothing, nothing. And then the Holocaust somehow dropped, you know, the Nazis dropped from outer space or something. And then there was nothing, which of course, any of us who know anything about Jewish history know that's certainly not the case, but that is how a lot of people in this country are thinking about anti-Semitism. Um, so I just wanna say that as, as some background, I find myself very often explaining some really basic things about anti-Semitism to, to people I'm, I'm talking to that I have to remind myself that of course, very few people understand Jews or anti-Semitism. Um, okay, so in terms of why we're at in this situation right now, um, I will let Lila do much more of the history, but I'll say a few kind of top line notes. So one is that whenever there's a time of uncertainty throughout history, we know that anti-Semitism often rises, and particularly in this moment when we see a rise in populism and fascism, both in this country and around the world, uh, that often goes with or contributes to a rise in anti-Semitism. Um, we've seen in particular a rise of white nationalism in this country enabled by the former president, of course, pre-existing him and continuing after him, but kind of let out from under its rock. I'll say also with the um, everything happening on Twitter, we see also that there's more 
uh, anti-Semitism that always existed, but is being allowed out right now. Um, it is, as I said, moments, a moment of uncertainty between the pandemic, between the economy. These are all the moments that often result in people looking around for someone to blame and Jews are a very convenient community to blame. Um, we're gonna talk, I'm sure, a lot about Israel later and about exactly where the line is between what's criticism of Israel, even harsh criticism, even criticism somebody might not like and anti-Semitism. So I'm not gonna go into the details there, but I'll just say that of course, the situation at any particular moment um, between Israel and Palestinians, what's going on in that piece of land does contribute to anti-Semitism. We'll explore that much more in depth. And of course, there are forces, um, particularly on the right, who are trying to use the Jews as a wedge, who are trying to use anti-Semitism as a wedge issue to drive Jews away from other communities. Um, and then there's anti-Semitism. The last thing that I'll say is that often we talk about anti-Semitism on the right and anti-Semitism on the left. And I actually really hate that framing because we don't talk about sexism on the right or sexism on the left. It's just not a framing that we have. So yes, anti-Semitism presents itself differently on the right, on the left, but it doesn't mean that all anti-Semitism is political. So just as an example, that there's lots of stereotypes, for example, about Jewish women that I'm not going to repeat here because I think we probably know them, or if not, you can ask somebody later. And those aren't political, right? They're, they don't, it's not that they're stereotypes on the right or left, or stereotypes about Jews and money, which is something that I'll say that I confront probably the most in my work. It's a stereotype that crosses over any political distinction. It's, it's not about the right or the left. Or when we see um, violent attacks, for example, in Brooklyn or other communities on um, Hasidic Jews, like somebody, I don't know, not knocking over someone's strimo or punching someone in the face. Those are, you can say that those are political attacks in that they're rooted in the very complicated history of those communities and where they sit, and particularly in the history of, um, of Hasidic community, of Haredi communities, and of Black communities in certain areas, but they're not like left and right. So I just want to get us out of that framework of thinking that everything has to fall into either this is left-wing anti-Semitism or this is right-wing anti-Semitism, not that that doesn't exist, but anti-Semitism does um, transcend those political divisions. Um, thanks so much for having me on this panel alone. And as Jill said, um, you know, I'm I'm just excited to be here for this conversation with um, people whose voices on these questions I respect. And if you hear yourself, Peter or Jill, in what I say, um, you're correct and you're meant to be footnoted. Um, so a couple of things that I think are worth putting out there. Um, first, you know, I come to this conversation differently from Jill or from Peter. You know, Jill talked about being a rabbi, leading an organization of rabbis. Um, Peter will talk about his positionality. Um, I come as somebody who's Jewish. I come as an American citizen. I come as a mother and I come as a historian. And over the past six or so years, I think all of those categories have sort of intersected in my own kind of efforts to try to understand what's going on. And um, I just want to kind of amplify what Jill said in terms of the fear being real, that, you know, um, really, I think my kind of deeper analysis of, of what is happening at this moment in American society and re with regard to anti-Semitism um, really hit me on a Saturday morning when I was doing what parents do often, which is shuttling my kids back and forth to different places, including to our synagogue, in a sense, sort of li living that kind of American Jewish synthesis that I had spent a lot of my career as a historian studying, you know, dropping one kid at a bar mitzvah while taking the other one to play squash at a cricket club, and then hearing the news that there had been a shooting in Pittsburgh, and trying to sort of figure out what it was that at that moment, you know, more than just concern about what had happened and about the lives that um, I learned had been lost, but trying to figure out why I felt like absolutely nothing had prepared me for this, even though I have professionally studied Jewish history for my career. Um, and really kind of confronting the fact that in the field of American Jewish history, it has become kind of an item of faith and even a foundation of the field that in a linear kind of progressive way, anti-Semitism in this country has diminished. 
And so, Jill, when you said that, you know, one of the misconceptions that you encounter among non-Jews is a sort of idea that, you know, after the Holocaust, it was done. Um, you know, I don't think that's just a misconception that a non-Jewish person might have. I think that in the field of American Jewish history, there has been a sort of sense that in the United States, anti-Semitism takes on a, a kind of anomalous or even exceptional quality because it's not the anti-Semitism of the Holocaust, right? And it's not the anti-Semitism of pogroms. And that part of the kind of distinction of the field of American Jewish history was that here is this one place in the diaspora anyway, where Jews have been able to live in security. Um, and, you know, I felt very profoundly after the Pittsburgh shooting that my field and, and my own scholarship had not adequately paid attention to anti-Semitism. Um, and I don't mean this to be like a full mea culpa, and I, I don't have the sense of pride to consider that my own um, intellectual mistakes have led to, you know, really cataclysmic problems. But I think that there is a sort of um, benighted understanding to the history of anti-Semitism in this country, um, and that that has not fueled anti-Semitism, but I think it has led to some really seriously kind of under-informed and like under-theorized even debates about anti-Semitism. And it's led to this kind of pulling apart into those kinds of categories that Jill was just talking about, you know, like as if we need to categorize everything as anti-Semitism on the left or anti-Semitism on the right, um, you know, as if as if we just, you know, kind of haven't thought about the, the questions about the structure of American white Christian nationalism and its relationship to anti-Semitism and, you know, done the kind of proper work really to scaffold a more complicated, necessary discussion about anti-Semitism. So that's, I think, one piece which doesn't answer why we're necessarily seeing an uptick in anti-Semitism, but I think it does provide some foundation for thinking about why our discussions about that, um, at least in my, my observation of them, seem um, so kind of frantic and anguished, but also so absent of, you know, some kind of foundational or common vocabulary and ways of thinking about it. And I tend to think history can, can help provide that. Um, in terms of why we're seeing that uptick, you know, I would really agree with, with what Jill said. And there's um, a historian named David Nirenberg, who's written about anti-Judaism and, and has, you know, done a, a lot of work to kind of think about the broader span of what he calls anti-Judaism. Um, and he uses a phrase that I think is useful. He talks about anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism as providing an available vocabulary. And I do think that that's very useful because um, there's a way in which almost like a kind of memory foam or something, um, you know, it, it, it has certain tropes and ideas that especially in moments of scarcity, in times when people feel crisis, um, you know, when there's just a sense of being unmoored, um, that that vocabulary has has never been entirely kind of eradicated or submerged. So there's a certain availability to it. And I think that sometimes, um, you know, there's a, a kind of confusion that anti-Semitism itself is actually a really good theory to explain something like power. Um, and that, you know, people kind of believe that it offers a way to think about what the problems are that they might be experiencing in their lives. And like any conspiracy theory that sometimes has sort of rootedness and things that you could empirically say might be true, like there are X number of Jews who are in Hollywood, right, which is something we've seen on the news, um, you know, in terms of the Dave Chappelle SNL thing, right? like then it becomes translated into a grander theory about how power operates. Um, I think we also see anti-Semitism used as a strategy, as a political strategy, um, whether it's dividing different kinds of alliances or gaining a certain kind of political energy. Um, and I think we've seen that happen even more in the last, um, you know, eight to five to eight years, let's say. Um, and, you know, I think that so the, the kind of conspiratorial element that 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 anti-Semitism is somehow a theory, the political element that anti-Semitism becomes a strategy. And I finally think and I'll stop here that anti-Semitism can also be backed into in a way. And this is something I'm observing more 
you know, just among my students and others that because of the way that social media works and because of the kind of readiness of memes and, and you know, just information kind of flying around, um, you know, people can kind of be trading in anti-Semitic ideas or tropes without necessarily realizing it. Um, and I have lots of questions about that, like kind of philosophical, like is it anti-Semitism if one doesn't realize it's anti-Semitism? Um, and I, I think it's worth talking about that. But, you know, I think that we see those three, the kind of conspiratorial, theoretical, the strategic, political, and then the kind of ignorantly or 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 unintentionally, um, you know, kind of technologically induced form of anti-Semitism as well. Um, alone, should I should I jump in? Um, great. So uh, thank you. First, it's a, it's a it's a real privilege to be with three people who I admire a great deal. Um, also, in, in just I guess it's just by way of self promotion, I, I, Jewish Currents, where I work, does a lot of does a lot of work on this, and I put the link into the chat. And I also write a free newsletter that kind of incorporates Jewish Currents works, but adds some of my own thoughts, which also deals with this kind of stuff um, more than I would have thought, to be honest. Um, um, I guess I would say a couple things. First of all, I think when we talk about an uptick in anti-Semitism, I just think we have to be a little bit modest in it. First of all, we don't have great data. Um, as, as, my Cohen at Jew, as my colleague at Jewish Currents, Mari Cohen, uh, illustrated, for various reasons, the data is not very good. Secondly, as Alone mentioned, we don't have a consensus definition of anti-Semitism, which is part of the reason um, uh, that, that, that the data can be very different, because incidents that might be defined by prominent American Jewish organizations as anti-Semitism might not be anti-Semitism in, in the eyes of, of myself or some others, especially when it has to do with Israel-Palestine. And third of all, I just think to make an obvious point, when one talks about an uptick, one also is always asking, what's the baseline, right? So for instance, Donald Trump, tra it was shocking because he traffics in anti-Semitic tropes so often, right? But if you go back you know, if you look, go back to Richard Nixon and look at the presidents preceding Richard Nixon, that wasn't that unusual, right? So it, it is unusual compared to the baseline that we established, let's say in the 1990s, maybe even the 1980s, but it's not unusual compared to an earlier baseline. Or if you think about violence against uh, Haredi Jews in New York City, it is a very disturbing. It seems like an uptick. If you compare it to the Crown Heights violence, for instance, where people's lives were lost, um, you know, a couple of several decades ago. It, it, so one always has to ask the question, obviously, what is one comparing it to as a baseline? Um, the the other point that I would make is to build up what, what um, Jill was saying about the language of left and right, which I think is really, really important and really interesting. And I guess I would say, on the one hand, I, yes, of course, anti-Semitism exists on the left and right, just in the way that sexism would exist on the right and left. And yes, there is also forms of kind of social or cultural anti-Semitism, which isn't necessarily that even that usefully analyzed through that kind of ideological frame. On the other hand, if we were to look at anti-Black racism or anti-sexism, we would we might say something like, of course it exists among people on the left and right. And yet if one looks at political movements in the United States, movements on the right have an agenda that is hostile to the, to the rights of, of Black Americans and the rights of, 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 of women in a way that the, that the left does not. And I think that that's also important to remember, right? That um, if we look at the, the best studies that I've seen about where anti-Semitic attitudes are most likely to reside in the United States, I'm thinking particularly about a recent paper by Eitan Hirsch and Laura Ro Royden, um, the, um, and, and actually similarly similar data in Europe done by uh, Andres Kovac and his colleague, it shows that, it's, that, that by a very, very large margin, anti-Semitic attitudes are much, much stronger on the political right than they are on the political left. Uh, it, it's not. It's not. It's not close. Um, and I think that to understand uh, um, to understand the ro the role that anti-Semitism is playing in American politics today, it's important to understand the way in which anti-Semitism plays into a larger 
I think, larger struggle about the concept of Americanness, really between the notion that we should aspire to be a, a country with a notion of citizenship, which is non-ethnic and non-racial, non-gendered, in which we aspire towards equality for the law for everybody, and also substantive equality without hierarchy, and a notion that this is essentially uh, a white Christian, or you could say Judeo-Christian, male, straight nation, or it was, and, and that those hierarchies need to be buttressed because the problem is that they've been eroded um, by demographic change and by, 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 by political change. And that, the, that, that anti-Semitism plays an important role in that larger struggle because for a lot of people on the political right, when they are trying to explain why America is no longer great, meaning by which I think in, in large part they mean why the hierarchies that were once clearer between, between men and women, between straight and LGBT, between Christians and non-Christians, why they have been destabilized a bit. Um, they see Jews as playing an important role in destabilizing those hierarchies, and therefore they, um, they, they uh, demonize or, or kind of deride or attack Jews as part because they see Jews as enemies in this larger struggle. And that has, I think, a lot to do with the fact that because Jews often have this, there is this, there is this stereotype of Jews as the kind of sinister genius. And there is a there is a stereotype of, of black and brown people as um, not having the capacity to organize themselves politically. And this is an old story, right? This is why so much of the anti-civil rights rhetoric suggested that Jewish communists were running the civil rights movement. When I was a kid, the child of South Africans, I was constantly hearing people say that Joe Slovo, you know, the uh, Lith Lithuanian Yiddish speaker was running the African National Congress when everyone knew that, who knew anything about anti-apartheid politics knew that he wasn't running the African National Congress. But it was again, the same notion of, well, blacks can't be doing this themselves, so the Jews must be behind it. I, I think you see that role, in that way, anti-Semitism plays an important role in explaining why it is that these hierarchies are being destabilized and why America, the why America as a white Christian male straight nation is being threatened. And so while I think that one, that's not, that's not the only important thing to understand about the rise of anti-Semitism in America today, I think politically, it's a very, very key thing for under, to us to understand. And sometimes the language of both sides, I think distracts us from that really, really central dynamic. Can I just pop in and say, I totally agree with Peter, what you just said, and thank you for just deepening, um, going a little deeper on something that I brought up. And I just wanna really put um, a point on the issue of legislation, because it is that what you mentioned, because it is very true that there are certain people who are trying to essentially legislate a white Christian America. And we see that all over the place, whether it's around abortion, whether it's around banning books, um, anything that, that people think is somehow, whether it's the, the don't say gay laws, attacks on trans kids, right? And those are not necessarily coming from an anti-Semitic position. It's not that somebody thinks, okay, I want to be, how can I enact my anti-Semitism? Let me pass this law. And they are at the same time rooted in the notion, like you said, of America, the true America as white and Christian and male. And that, of course, is inconsistent with having Jews be um, as much a part of America as anybody else, let alone other kind, other minority groups. Anybody doesn't fall into that category of white, Christian, male. And there certainly is one group that is, um, or one political side that is legislating in that way. And then also you know, not coming from a place that is technically anti-Semitic, but of course, the thing that we're many of us are most terrified of is, is guns, whether they're in synagogues or schools or any place else that we might be trying to go about our business and not get shot. And of course, um, there's one side in, in the political spectrum that is um, pushing for more guns to be available, which is much scarier than somebody saying something mean on Twitter. So how should Jews react to these diverse trends that you have all uh, illustrated, of course, who are the Jews in the sentence Jews, because there are different Jews, different organizations, different people with different interests, but we have a special envoy for anti-Semitism, Professor Deborah Lipstadt. Biden has now instituted an emergency task force for anti-Semitism. What can you, 
what would you propose? What, uh, what uh, do you think um, one can request or demand of the, of the administration, of the people with political power to do about, about the, 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 the varieties of antisemitisms, whether they are inflated or whether they are real, um, that exist. So this is a political question. That is what, um, how, 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 how can we discuss it apart from philosophically or complaining or how can we discuss it politically? Jane, would you like to start? I'll let somebody else jump in first. <laughs> I can. Uh, go ahead, go ahead, Lila, please. No, please, Peter, go ahead. I mean, this may be an obvious or even a cliche answer, but because I believe that the most dangerous anti-Semitism is deeply intertwined with other forms of bigotry against kind of conspicuous and historically marginalized groups. Um, and because I think that Jews are in, but and also because I think Jews are in a somewhat unusual position in that in, to some degree, there is in certain circumstances, the kind of the offer to Jews as embodied by the phrase Judeo-Christian, that Jews could be on the side of the powerful, right? That we're, yes, we are gonna divide things. This is gonna be a clear country. This is gonna be a country that's owned by certain people and not owned by other people. But good news, Jews, we're now not, we're not gonna make it a white Christian America. We're gonna make it a white Judeo-Christian America, which means that you can be on the side of the, of the winners uh, as long as you go along with our agenda. And you see this with, in Trump's rhetoric all the time, right? It's kind of like, I love Jews, but Jews just need to get with the program. The program above all means support me, right? It also means support Israel, but it's kind of conditional. And again, you know, uh, this, is not a, this is not a story that's only played out in the United States, you know? Um, uh, in South Africa, the, the, family, the country where my family comes from, um, Jews were seen as disloyal because Jews were involved uh, to some degree because Jews were involved in the anti-apartheid movement, but there were other very prominent Jews like Percy Utar, the um, president of the largest Orthodox synagogue in Johannesburg who prosecuted the Ravonia trial in 1964, prosecuted Mandela and a group of Jewish defendants who showed their loyalty, accepted the offer that was on offer from the Afrikaner political regime to show their loyalty and they loved Percy Utar. He was, they thought he was awesome. Um, and so it seems to me that um, that ultimately the challenge for us is to reject that poisoned chalice, to push inside all of our institutions, to reject that poison chalice because we have institutions that are actually embracing it. Um, uh, the Zionist Organization for America would be one very obvious example, I'll name names. Um, and secondly, also to say that when we see politicians who are involved very clearly in st stigmatizing and trying to demonize other disenfranchised groups, let's say Ron DeSantis, who's a kind of uh, national leader in black disenfranchisement, we don't say, oh, Ron DeSantis is good because he's not actually associating Jews and money and, 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 and saying Jews are disloyal. Um, and so he's the good guy and we can now support him and while Donald Trump is the bad guy, but we instead say, no, actually the kind of politics that Ron DeSantis is practicing threaten American liberal democracy. They're hostile to the notion of equality under the law. And that is bad for Jews. It's not just bad for us in terms of our beliefs, but ultimately I think it's bad for our safety and our position in the United States because this stuff tends to come back to us. Remember the guy in Pittsburgh, and I'll stop here. The, the, the murder in Pittsburgh didn't start out with hot hatred of Jews. He started with hate, with, with this Fox News generated in hysteria about America being invaded by a caravan of asylum seekers for Latin America. And then he got to Jews because he decided that Jews were responsible for that. So I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, you know, it's interesting what Peter's saying because it was making me reflect on the fact that like, you know, not to knock down what you just said, but it's, it's not such a novel insight. Like this was actually the way that Jewish organizations in the early 20th century that started as kind of, you know, anti-defamation organizations, civil rights organizations, this was exactly their, their theory of the case, right? That even if it wasn't necessarily Jews whose freedoms were being impinged upon by um, whether it was laws or behaviors, that those needed to be watched because it affected ultimately 
Jews, right, and, and everyone. Um, and that the kind of desire to protect ideas of liberal democracy, wherever they might be um, not, you know, not fully bolstered, came out of exactly what Peter was talking about. So it's, I think there's something useful we can learn from that, which is that, you know, in many ways, we can tell that as a success story, I, you know, we could point to a lot of legislation, a lot of cases that those Jewish organizations were involved in, that they were writing amicus briefs for, that they were drafting you know, pieces of, of statutes of civil rights legislation, um, that that insight, I think, mattered. And I think part of the reason that my field had you know, felt quite certain that anti-Semitism diminished is because they really did give credit to that kind of transitive property mode of fighting anti-Semitism. But I also think we could learn about what was maybe neglected in those efforts. And, you know, the primary thing that was neglected and not without some important historical reason was the kind of economic side of American um, political economy. And so a lot of the efforts, especially post-World War II, especially with the rise of, you know, harsh forms of anti-communism, a lot of the kind of civil rights efforts focused on the, the legislative sphere and moved away from focusing on questions of economic redistribution, which, you know, the American Jewish Congress, which is one such organization, um, you know, that, that I'm describing, had in the 1940s put forward a kind of vision for integrating economic analysis into the work they were doing. But in the 1950s, that was really quite vanquished because there was such concern that any kind of effort to, to push forward a conversation about economic redistribution, even as the kind of um, foundations of the American social welfare state were being shaped, and we could talk about that inconsistency. But but that was you know really seen as stepping outside of the boundaries of what a loyal American could do. And there were purges, you know, communist purges from from organizations. And so I I really do think that you know in this question of of how should Jewish leaders and organizations be thinking about this? Sorry, I have the sun kind of because I'm saying such brilliant illuminating things coming in on me, uh, you know, but but I do think one thing we can learn is not only to kind of carry forward that thread that Peter was describing, but to pay attention to the fact that the neglect of those questions of, of economics um, was probably really to the detriment of, of the success of those efforts. Thank you. I want to agree with um, everything that Lila and Peter just said. And um, to say, I hesitated at the beginning because there's not, it's not like there's a law that we could pass that would suddenly eradicate anti-Semitism. Like there is no, maybe someone super brilliant can figure out what that law is and it can also eradicate all kinds of other isms, but I don't think so. Um, so it is very much about protecting liberal democracy and Lila, I really appreciate you're also bringing up the economic questions. Um, but something that I do wanna say that I think will maybe shift our conversation to the question of the line between what's criticism of Israel and what's anti-Semitism is that there are a lot of attempts right now to legislate around um, what some people consider to be anti-Semitism. And in many cases, those efforts are ones that might be done. I don't want to judge anybody's motives. I think that in many cases, they're done with good motives, other cases perhaps not, but they're done in ways that are actually not protecting Jews and are proving to be a distraction or worse. So I just want to give um, two examples that I know that we're gonna, that we were planning anyway to dive into. So one is efforts to legislate what's called the IRA definition of anti-Semitism, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. I think I got that acronym right. If not, somebody can correct me. Um, definition of anti-Semitism, which you can all Google and find online. That is a um, very short definition of anti-Semitism, but then comes with some examples. And some of those examples have been interpreted in such a way as to um, try to uh, attack um, pro-Palestinian activism. I think, Lila, you can talk specifically about how it's playing out in college campuses, which is one of the main places that it's playing out. And so there's been a lot of both local and national fights around attempts either in city councils or in even um, attempts even on the federal level to, to legislate this definition that was actually never meant to be legislated. It was meant to be a descriptor um, to describe anti-Semitism in Europe, and now is being, uh, there's attempts, as I said, to legislate it. And it is not something that's keeping uh, Jews safer at all. What it is doing is 
it's pushing forward a definition of anti-Semitism or examples of anti-Semitism that um, have at their core an attempt to cut down on criticism of Israel, even in such a way that um, diminishes the free speech rights of pro-Palestinian activists. Now, I wanna say that it doesn't mean that there, there's a line between, you know, free speech includes speech that one might not like. So one can say, I don't like that thing that you're saying. I disagree with it. I think you're wrong, right? You can say all of that. And presumably all of the several hundred of us on, on this call have different places where they might say that, but um, that doesn't mean that it necessarily crosses the line into anti-Semitism. And so that's one place where we see legislation that is misguided and ultimately a distraction or worse, um, often often worse as it's um, really the, the people who are feeling the, the weight of these efforts are um, Palestinian activists and other and pro-Palestinian um, and allies. Um, around free speech rights. And then the second place, which is related, is the anti-BDS laws that have at this point passed through about 35 states. And these are laws, they're written in a few different ways, but essentially what they say is that a state can't do business with any company that is, in some cases, boycotting, just actively boycotting Israel or boycotting Israel and the territories it includes. So that would include the occupied Palestinian territories, or in some cases, there's a requirement that any company that's doing business with the state is going to, uh, has to sign something affirmative saying that they will not support a boycott. So they're written in slightly different ways. Sometimes it only applies to companies doing $100,000 of business. Sometimes it doesn't. So there's lots of different ways that it, um, that these play out. Um, I'll just tell one story of the case that may go to the Supreme Court. It's a case that TRA has been involved in filing amicus briefs as it's been moving up and, and actually just filed um, together with our partners J Street and Americans for Peace Now um, for the if it, if it is accepted to be heard by the Supreme Court. And it's a case involving a newspaper publisher in Arkansas, um, the Arkansas Times, which is a local Arkansas paper that writes about Arkansas, not really interested in anything outside of Arkansas. And they got um, a lot ad revenue from one of the campuses of the University of Arkansas. And they were told that because of the bill that, that passed there, that they were going to have to sign something saying that they wouldn't support a boycott. Of course, they're a publisher. They were not going to sign away their First Amendment rights. It's been moving up the courts. There was one decision for the publisher, one decision against the publisher. Like I said, um, the ACLU just filed uh, for cert in the Supreme Court. Um, a month or so ago, and we will find out sometime in 2023 whether that is moving into whether the Supreme Court is going to hear that case. So that's a situation where, just to unpack it a little bit, um, the you know I'll say this: this newspaper was not thinking about Israel before. Now they're thinking about it every day. Um, this is not something that uh, has protected certainly is, that has not protected Jews. One of our members is Rabbi Barry Block, who's the rabbi of the largest synagogue in Arkansas, and he is out there very publicly saying that. The people who introduced this law were right-wing Christian um, legislators. They didn't come talk to the Jewish community. They didn't come talk to, um, they certainly didn't talk to him. They didn't talk to anybody in the Jewish community, that it's not something that's protecting Jews in Arkansas. Um, one of those legislators is actually on tape saying um, that he didn't feel like in, in a movie that just came out, Boycott, that he didn't feel like he had to talk to the Jewish community because they don't see eye to eye. And then he said something like, I don't care if you're Jewish or Christian, if you don't believe in Jewish in Jesus Christ, you're going to hell, right? So this is not somebody who's interested in protecting the Jewish community. Um, so these laws have passed through, like I said, I think 35 states, and they're also providing a template for other laws that are cutting down on free speech. So Texas, for example, has passed laws that say that the state can't do business with companies that discriminate, that's the language, against firearms manufacturers or um, ammunition manufacturers. Those are laws that are taking direct aim at banks that have decided that they're not gonna lend to certain companies based on their, certain firearms companies based on their practices, um, like major banks, like Bank of America, JP Morgan Chase, um, and that also that the state can't do business with companies that discriminate against fossil fuel companies. That's taking direct aim at BlackRock. And so these are, so basically the end, we are seeing now that these anti-BDS bills were kind of the test run for a larger set of bills that are aimed at, um, at, at silencing free speech 
because of course, if you're a bank you might and you wanna do business with the state of Texas, you might think twice about any restrictions you're making on whether you lend firearms to manufacturers or, your, or whether you divest from fossil fuel companies. Um, and um, these are ALEC, the, the right-wing legislation writing organization has written these, these sample models. They're literally the same as the anti-BDS laws. You just take out Israel and you put in fossil fuel companies. And so we're seeing that the Jewish community, even though a lot of the Jewish community got behind these anti-BDS bills because the vast majority of our community does not support BDS. I wanna say TRA does not participate in the BDS movement. And we believe in free speech, which includes the, the right to boycott. Um, so the, I think for a lot of our community, they thought, okay, this is something that is cutting down, that is, is gonna cut down on anti-Semitism. It stops boycotts of Israel. We care about Israel, all these things. And in some cases, um, it wasn't only the Jewish community that was pushing forward these bills, it was Christians United for Israel. And like I said, um, just right wing legislators, but in many cases, the Jewish community was involved in passing these bills. And now we can look back and we can say that our community was used as, was really used in order to push open the door for a much wider set of laws that are um, really a threat to democracy that are, um, you can see that anything that legislators in one state don't like, they can pass a bill saying, well, we won't do business with any company that uh, makes their decisions in this way or that way. Thanks, Jill. Let me say that our, our Q&A tab is, uh, has a malfunction, so we can't have your questions. We are sorry for that. Um, so let us talk about this division uh, with respect to anti-Semitism, Israel, and uh, Palestine. And, and it seems now that there is a conflation of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. Beyond that, actually, people who demand equal rights for the Palestinians or who think about various possible political solutions to the question of Israel-Palestine, are also called anti-Semites. We should think that uh, uh, distinguished Jewish thinkers like Hannah Arendt, Martin Buber, uh, Magnus, uh, thought of uh, Jewish sovereignty not as an exclusive national right, but as a bi-national thing. No one called them anti-Semites, and I don't think we want to call them anti-Semites today. But the term, the moniker anti-Semitic is now being used very clearly for one side of, I would say, the political thought. Um, well, what, what, how, how can we unpack it? What can we do with it? Um, Go ahead. I'll, I'll give like one piece that I think is just part of the puzzle. And, you know, I think there's so many different ways to, to try to get into that question. Um, so this might be a small one, but I hope it offers a kind of lens. Um, it's been striking to me on the different kinds of survey tools that are used in the discussions to try to understand anti-Semitism on college campuses that it seems that this is much more than the kind of, you know, Charlottesville right wing white nationalist face of anti-Semitism. The kind of quote unquote anti-Semitism on the left discussion has tended to alight on university campuses. I think that's sort of ground zero for that discussion. Um, and separately, I am really interested in, in kind of puzzling out why that fixation on college campuses has sort of stuck so much. And I think there's a number of different ways to think about it, though I, I don't have a you know complete answer to it. But one thing that is really striking is the kind of creation of the, the discourse or maybe the consciousness raising for Jewish students to identify expressions of anti-Semitism or pro-Palestinianism as anti-Semitism. And, you know, in different survey tools and in different definitions of anti-Semitism or kind of PSAs that different Jewish organizations put out, it strikes me that there is a kind of um, re-education or a form of education going on by which parents of college students and college students themselves are meant to understand that um, when they see those expressions, 
they should identify them as anti-Semitism. And therefore, when they're asked, are you experiencing anti-Semitism on your campus? They should say yes, because there are pro-Palestinian movements on many different American campuses. Um, and, you know, it's such a curious kind of way in which this puzzle is kind of working itself out, right? Like, so the kind of consciousness raising, and I've heard people sort of explicitly say, well, I, you know, I encountered a, Jewish, a, a group of Jewish students on campus. They didn't realize that what they were seeing from another organization was anti-Semitic until I explained it to them, um, which I, again, you know, I, I think it's, it's an interesting puzzle to kind of unpack. Um, but the other component of it is that there is also this kind of like jaggedness between asserting that um, any time that Israel is kind of used as a stand-in for the Jews, that that is a problem and that's anti-Semitic, right? So that tends to be one of the ways we sort of talk about when criticism of Israel becomes anti-Semitism, if it's sort of being used as a proxy to talk about all Jews and that it's really an anti-Semitic thing if you, you know, say that because the current leaders of the state of Israel did X, Y, or Z, that all Jews are there for X, Y, or Z. But at the same time, again, as part of this kind of educational complex to sort of consciousness raise about Jewishness and Zionism, there is also a sort of growing discourse that Zionism is intrinsic to Jewish identity. And so you cannot actually separate those things. And so it ends up being this kind of curious position where we are maybe meant to say that, you know, you may not, it's disallowed, it's anti-Semitic to associate Jewishness, you know, kind of seamlessly with Israel. And by the way, you cannot extricate, you cannot separate Jewishness from Zionism. And because of that, if there is something that's anti-Zionist on my campus, I am therefore able to say that that is anti-Semitism and then actions should be taken. So those are some of the, look, it's the academic thing. I'll just say those are some of the puzzles. I don't have the solution, but I, I hope it's like kind of helpful to open some of that. Yeah, I'd love to just respond to a couple of things. I think, first of all, the point that you're making, Lila, is extremely important. If we want to, if we want people to to make a clear distinction between Jews uh, 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 and Israel, we have to do that ourselves. We, we, the, the uh, too, ma too many American Jewish organizations are trying to have it both ways. You know, um, the the chief rabbi, the current chief rabbi of, of of the UK, recently said that Zionism leaps out from every page of the Siddur of the prayer of of a prayer book. Think about the implications of saying that, right? If you say that the Siddur, the prayer book, is a Zionist document right? Then why would you be surprised if people who wanted to protest against Israel also decided to protest against prayer books, right? It's a very, very dangerous thing, thing to do. Um, the second point is, I think, honestly, one of the reasons that, that there's so much attention on college campuses as a site for anti-Semitism is because college campuses have often been, in American history, the site of, pro, of, of movements for justice. Um, they, were, they were critical in the last American anti-apartheid movement, and they are imp an important source of, the, of a new anti-apartheid movement that is emerging against, uh, against the state of Israel, which has been declared an apartheid state by the most prominent and respected human rights organizations in the world, and also by Israel's, uh, uh, not to mention the Palestinian human rights organization. So I think you can't take that out of this fact, right? There's a fear that college campuses may be a place that actually produces a movement for justice for Palestinians. The argument that anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism is first of all, as Alana was saying, it's just first of all ab absurd because you would have to, among the other great Jewish figures and thinkers that you would have to declare an anti-Semite would be the Satma Rebbe, right? Or both Satma Rebbe's, right? Because the Satma Rebbe's are, are passionately anti-Zionist. Um, uh, but it's not just absurd, it's also deeply dehumanizing because um, it suggests that Palest it essentially turns all Palestinians into anti-Semites. Right? How many? Pal why would we expect that Palestinians would be Zionists? Right? Even if you think that Zionism has been the greatest thing since sliced bread for Jews, it's not been a. It's not been a movement that has been very good for Palestinians. Why would we expect that Palestinians would want to live in a state that explicitly privileges Jews over them? 
rather than a state where they're treated equally. And if you say that Palestinians have to be, if they are, who are anti-Zionist are bigots, you, you essentially delegitimize all Palestinian political expression and you call all Palestinians essentially bigots, which means that you can that you don't have to pay attention to them and essentially that you can, you can abuse them. Um, and the last point I would make is, the more sophisticated version of the argument is, well, not all anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism, but we need to look carefully at when anti-Zionism crosses the line into anti-Semitism. Let me say this. If you want to say that, you also need to ask the question of when Zionism crosses into anti-Semitism. The problem of asking the question when anti-Zionism crosses into line into anti-Semitism is it suggests that anti-Zionists are more likely to be anti-Semites than Zionists. That's just plain not true. The evidence that we have, again, overwhelmingly shows that, that anti-Semitic attitudes in the US and Europe are far stronger on the political right. They also show that pro-Israel sentiments, Zionist sentiments are far stronger on the political right. The countries in Europe, Poland, Romania, which are the most anti-Semitic are also the most pro-Israel. The segments in the United States, white Christian evangelicals, that express uh, the, the uh, particularly non-college educators who express the most pro-Israel sentiments also also are most likely to answer to give anti-Semitic attitudes on questions like do you use much too much power do they control the media et cetera et cetera so we need to stop asking the question when anti-Zionism becomes anti-Semitism unless we're also willing to ask the question when Zionism becomes anti-Semitism. Thanks to both of you. Um, so I want to mention a few things. So first, I want to start with this question of, is Zionism indistinguishable from Judaism? Because um, very often people are answering that question on different sides in a way that is way, way too simplistic. So you hear on one side, sometimes something that you hear from the far left is, well, Zionism, this connection to the land of Israel is just created, right? The alleged temple, Jews never had a history here. Um, today's Jews are not actually real Jews. You hear, you do hear some of that on the far left. I'm not saying that's the dominant voice, but it does it does exist that Jews never had a connection to the land of Israel. And if you look in a Sidor, you'll find out that that's wrong, that the connection to Eretz Israel, the land of Israel is, is there throughout Jewish history. Um, and on the other side, is, as we heard, you hear people say, well, Zionism is indistinguishable from, from Judaism, right? The Sidor is a, is a Zionist book, et cetera, et cetera. And that is also an ahistorical reading because Zionism emerged in the context of other nationalisms and other minority rights movements in, um, in the 19th, early 20th century as an, like for, for much of Jewish history, there was a longing to return to Israel. Yes, we have many fast days that are about the destruction of the temple. Um, we have, we pray for a return to, to Jerusalem every day, three times a day, right? All of that is true. And for much of Jewish history, there was an assumption that that would come by divine intervention. So the innovation of Zionism was to say, let's use modern political means, right? We're in a moment in which lots of different nationalities and minorities are, are calling for their own for their own rights. Let's, um, in, in that context, let's also use political means, whether it's an appeal to the Ottoman Empire or the British Empire or moving people to Israel, to what became Israel, et cetera, let's use modern political means to create a state. Um, so that is different than praying for God to step in and return us to Eretz Israel. So I just wanna say that, that there's flattening that happens. Um, the second thing about the line between what's criticism of Israel and what's anti-Semitism, you can go pretty far in criticism of Israel or really any other country without stepping into anti-Semitism. Um, and sometimes criticism does step into anti-Semitism. So what I find is useful is first to remember that Israel is a country, which should be an obvious statement, but sometimes it doesn't feel obvious because sometimes particularly in the Jewish community and honestly also beyond it, we talk about Israel as an idea, a project, an expression of our own identity. Like we're not actually talking about the real place, which is a real country, it's a member of the UN. Um, it's also a place that is carrying on an occupation of millions of Palestinians. Um, so that is the technical legal definition of what is of what's going on there. And um, as a country, as soon as Israel became a country, it meant that it was bound to the same international human rights as every other country 
that's a member of the UN. Now, every country is violating those human rights in various ways on a continuum from ones that are doing a particularly terrible job to ones that are doing an okay job, right? But everybody is everybody's somewhere on that continuum. Um, Israel, there are many, many human rights violations that I won't name now, but just starting with pretty much everything that happens inside of the occupied territories. Um, so you can criticize Israel on those grounds. I find it often very useful when we're talking about if, if a criticism of Israel is criticism of a country or, um, or across the land to anti-Semitism to ask, well, could you say this about any other country? Um, right? Can you put in another country? Does it make sense? And so, for example, like boycotts of Israel, I don't boycott Israel, and I do stand up for the free speech of, of people who want to boycott Israel, um, but boycotts of a country, I mean, any country is subject to boycott. We're all boycotting Russia at this point. Um, my own organization has called for clothing companies to not buy cotton from the Uyghur region of China. Now, is that anti-Chinese? I would certainly hope that that call doesn't translate into any action against, let's say, Chinese nationals in the United States or, China, or Chinese American citizens or anybody else, um, right? It's, it's a criticism of country based on the fact that they're carrying out a genocide against an ethnic minority. Um, so we always have to ask those questions and to say that something might feel for those of us who are Jewish, who have a deep relationship with Israel or Israeli, right? Like that, something sometimes something might feel uncomfortable it doesn't sit right with us we don't like it we disagree with it we think they're wrong but it doesn't mean that it crosses into anti-semitism and it's really critically important to be clear about where that line is because it hampers our ability to fight actual anti-semitism when we're crying wolf about incidents that aren't anti-semitism so if we're always saying that's anti-semitism because it's a boycott of israel because it's pro-palestinian activity because fill in the blank then when something actually crosses the line into anti-Semitism, nobody's gonna believe us because, we're, um, because we've been crying wolf. Um, and also just to reiterate something I said before, very often the um, attempts to classify any uh, pro-Palestinian activity, um, protests, as particularly on campus as anti-Semitism, the people who end up getting hurt are Palestinian students or not students and their allies. Um, so I just wanna say that we have to make the lines really, really clear. Um, just to, I'll just plug one resource. I think that there's some links that are going out either here or on a follow-up email, but Trust produced a resource that's a brief guide to anti-Semitism. It's a little pamphlet that you can buy just pocket-sized and also you can download as a PDF. You can find it very easily on our website. It's truad.org, T-R-U-A-H.org backslash anti-Semitism, all one word. And one of the things we do there is provide both a very short guide to the history of anti-Semitism and also a guide to when criticism of Israel crosses a line and when it doesn't. Can so, I just jump in really yeah, sure. quickly to add an addendum? Yes. So I really respect everything that you're saying, Jill. And um, you know, I think it's useful to have rubrics like that. I also think that in the kind of desire to make those clear-cut distinctions, um, sometimes we forget that context is always so essential. And I'm thinking very particularly about cases on university campuses um, where, you know, it seems most important to really talk to people who are on the ground, try to figure out, you know, what happened at a particular parade or what happened, um, you know, when there was a particular kind of protest. And that actually scripting something into being anti-Semitism or not, in many of those cases, is kind of useless. Um, and that, you know, it's it's much more important to kind of ask questions about, you know, how do people talk again across lines of profound difference, right? And how, um, you know, how can we do better to create an environment that is hospitable for the learning of a diversity of students? And one thing that I see happening because of this kind of, kind of craze to define, and especially this kind of what I would see also as a sort of fervor or craze to codify the IRA definition is that there's just such a sort of myopic focus on getting this in place. And then once we have it, like, you know, I'll just be able to sort anti-Semitic, not anti-Semitic, anti right? And, and that ends up, you know, actually not being a, a, a very useful heuristic or interpretive tool and not being helpful, at least 
in the cases that, you know, in, in many of the cases, not all of them, but in many of the cases that people talk about on university campuses where somebody does legitimately feel like they are in a hostile environment, like they are having a hard time expressing their ideas and their views. And they certainly deserve to be able to talk about that, but it doesn't need to be kind of slotted into one category or another to be discussed. And I see sometimes outside organizations kind of forcing things into that way and universities having to jump for all sorts of reasons. Um, and, and that ends up, I think, really kind of undermining a, a process that has to be contextual, a process that has to be about relationships and, and contingency and isn't really about kind of a clear line. Can I just say um, something? Uh, so, yes, I think really strongly that the people who should be involved in dealing with what's happening on a college campus are the people who are actually there. The students are for sure um, smartest about what's going on among the students and then also the people, whether it's professors or chaplains or um, just other student life people or the other people who are actually on the campus and understand the context can deal with what's happening on the campus the best. I was just I was just at the J Street conference last week and I was on a panel with um, this very lovely J Street U student leader from University of Michigan. And he told this amazing story about basically an anti, uh, an, a, that there was one protest that was going on that was a pro-Palestinian protest. And then there were some um, counter protesters who were waving an Israeli flag and it was sort of getting tense. And uh, he and some other students were able to just <coughs> essentially create a space for people to talk to each other and actually heal, hear each other. And in that way, counter um, what would likely have ended. Well, I don't know. This is what I'm adding on. He didn't say this, but you could imagine a situation where some outside organization got um, a snippet of conversation from, let's say, the pro-Palestinian protest and said, oh, this is an anti-Semitic campus, et cetera, et cetera. But actually the students were just able to deal with it, um, with the situation there, with I think probably the help of also other, other staff there, but really the students could deal with it. And I think that's really crucially important. There's, um, and we talked to a lot of rabbis on campus in particular, who um, whose assessment is that when outside organizations jump on a situation on campus, um, then it just blows things up, right? When there's some story that gets reported out in the Jewish journal that might be taking like a little snippet of information out of context and, and blowing it up, then um, then things get really, it doesn't actually help Jewish students or anybody else in the campus. And I know Lila, you're, you're living with it every single day. And just to say that, um, first of all, I just think that students are gonna be smarter than any of the rest of us in, in working things out relationally with, with their peers and also the outside organizations I don't think ever actually helped the situation. They just helped to inflame it. Hold on, can I can I jump in? Uh, um, I, I think I think it's also critically important that we talk when we're talking about Israel Palestine. We can't have and debate about Israel Palestine. We can't have a conversation about anti-Semitism, which doesn't also engage with the question of anti-Palestinian bigotry, which is so pervasive in American public political discussion as to be almost invisible. Right. So. The question becomes, well, let's scrutinize this claim, this, the, this language that Ilhan Omar used, where she talked about the role of money as being influential in APAC and whether that plays into anti-Semitic tropes. Fine, let's scrutinize it. But let's do so in the context of the fact that 90 or 95 percent of the members of Congress are totally fine, if not wildly enthusiastic about the about supporting a, a, a an environment in which millions of Palestinians have fewer rights than a black person in Mississippi in the 1950s, i.e. they're not even citizens of the country in which they live in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, or Gaza, even though they live under Israeli control, right? So all of a sudden, the question becomes a thousand conversations about whether Ilhan Omar is an anti-Semite. Can we have a conversation about whether Kevin McCarthy is an anti-Palestinian bigot? Because by on the evidence, he the kind of the kind of bigotry he's in, involved in a kind of bigotry supportive enthusiastically supportive of a kind of bigotry which is much much more profound much more crude much more obvious than anti than Ilhan Omar being involved in some kind of anti anti-Semitic trope. trope. And I mentioned Kevin McCarthy, but I could say the same thing about the vast majority of Democrats, say the same thing about Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi. There's much more evidence that they are complicit in anti-Palestinian bigotry than Rashid Tlaib and Ilhan Omar are involved in anti-Semitic, in anti-Semitism. And, and on one, this is going to become 
I think, a bigger issue because although uh, the political leaders in the United States and establishment Jewish organizations would like to pretend that there is no such thing as anti-Palestinian bigotry, on college campuses, there are more people who are asking the question, when does pro-Israel uh, uh, activism um, or, 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 or support for political Zionism become, become bigotry? Right in a circumstance in which Zion political Zionism is the state ideology of a country that has been declared an apartheid state by the most the most respected human rights organizations in the world and in that country itself, and that's it seems to me something. The response to that will be that that's just another example of anti-Semitism, right? But in fact, what we need to do is be able to hold a conversation in which there are, is such a thing as anti-Palestinian bigotry, and we need to fight that as we fight anti-Semitism. I'd like to ask you a final question, and it is about the present. And I'm thankful for various uh, proactive participants in our audience who took the initiative to write me emails with their questions. <laughs> and, and, and the question that appears most often is about the present. That is, they ask, a new government is to be installed in Israel which is, um, according to its members, racist, uh, homophobic, sexist, and anti-LGBTQ. Um, how does this um, impact our fight against anti-Semitism in America? That is, what is the moral authority of Jews to oppose correctly so, anti-Semitism at home, while some of these Jews support the government of Israel who denies equal rights to the Palestinians and also to women, LGBTQ and others. So, so if the situation of anti-Semitism has not been complex enough, we have now, uh, I'm, I'm interpreting the questions, we have now another complexity thrown in with a very explicit racist government in Israel. Um, I don't think that we can find a closure here or we can or we can find a full answer, but perhaps some thoughts and we are going to leave our audience with with that. I can jump in. Okay, so first of all, I don't think there's sufficient words that I know or that I could say on a on a webinar about how terrifying and alarming this this new government is. I mean, just on every level, like just first of all, the I mean, the inclusion of extremists, the return of Netanyahu, et cetera, et cetera. We know that it's a government that is going to um, expand demolitions and expulsions um, in the West Bank. That it's a government that's going to expand settlements that it's going to, um, one of its first acts is gonna be a direct attack on Israeli democracy with, with what's called the override law, um, which is going to reduce the power of the high court, um, attacks on, of course, LGBTQ people, women, um, et cetera, and, um, and also attacks on NGOs, um, really just a stated, a stated desire to go to war against Israeli NGOs in particular, there's already um, in the last government, an attack on Palestinian NGOs, which will continue and probably deepen. So I could just go on and on with all of the examples of why this government is terrifying for Palestinians, for Israelis, for um, just for democracy, for just every every category. And like I said, there's not enough words or um, words that are allowed in polite company to express the kind of alarm that we should be having about this government. So I just want to say that. And it's not just about the extremists, right? Like, I think that there's an emerging idea of like, well, there's some bad apples, right? There are some terrible people in the government, but Netanyahu sitting right at the top is the one who made this all possible. And we know from the last, from the 12 years that he spent in, in power, that he is somebody who is happy to attack democracy, who already went after Israeli NGOs and certainly um, expanded settlements and expulsions and, and all of that. So it's not just about the Eder Mabrin Gvirs and Smotriches and, and those people who we're hearing a lot about. So just wanna say that first of all, and the people who are gonna suffer. I, I'm, I'm hearing a lot of conversations in the American Jewish community about 
well, what does this mean for Israeli diaspora relations? And that's just a wrong question because the people who are actually gonna suffer are the people who are on the ground. This goes back to thinking about Israel as kind of like a theoretical idea as opposed to it's a place that has you know, roughly 9 million citizens, 80% Jewish, 20%-ish um, Palestinian citizens, plus another 5 million or so Palestinians living under occupation. Like those are real people who are trying to live their lives and not get killed and send their kids to school and all the other things that people wanna do with their lives. So um, we just have to really keep the focus on the impact on the ground and not make it some theoretical idea. So um, that said, the best thing that American Jews or anybody can do is fight with the together with the people who are on the ground, with civil society and human rights leaders, both Palestinian and Israeli, for um, for a better future and to follow the lead of the people who are on the ground. So that's what we can actually, that's what we can actually do. And um, and certainly not to walk away. I was, um, you know, some of you probably saw that Abe Foxman like a week or two ago said, well, now I can't support Israel. And it's like, if you spent 50 years essentially defending certain policies of the Israeli government, you just don't walk away from those 14 million people. You you partner with those who are fighting for democracy and for civil society and for human rights. So um, that's what we all, sh all should do. And the question of the impact on anti-Semitism, yes, there will be an impact on anti-Semitism, especially as, um, there's, as there's probably more tension and unfortunately likely more violence and more death um, as we see Netanyahu presumably do what he's done all along, which is to partner with other authoritarian um, leaders across the world, whether it's Orban or Modi or anybody else. Um, so we're gonna, yes, for sure, um, both certainly his actions in propping up those um, those populist fascist um, leaders is is helping to contribute to anti-Semitism as well as other bigotries around the world. Um, and certainly there will be outbreaks of anti-Semitism that are unfortunately directed at American Jews, even if it's coming from anger about Israel, and we do have to, to name those when they happen. Um, and also it's, we fight anti-Semitism and we can fight for democracy in Israel. Like those aren't separate. I think about, you know, in my model of let's put in a different country, I am, I'll say that I am not at all involved in anything going on in Italy. I know only what is in the main newspapers, right? But Italy is a fascist government and now, and um, if we want to, do something about that situation, what we would do is we would find out who the people are on the ground, the human rights and civil society people who are fighting fascism in Italy, and we would try to support them. It doesn't mean that we would go and, I don't know, boycott our local Italian restaurant, right? That doesn't make any sense. Or to give the example about China, is like we can support a boycott on, um, on products that are produced under slave labor in Xinjiang without taking it out on Chinese people who are our friends and neighbors. So we just have to be able to separate. We can fight anti-Semitism and we can fight against occupation and fight for democracy in Israel. And, um, and those don't have to be at odds with each other. They shouldn't be at odds with each other. I know we're, we're running short. And so I think I'll just say something, you know, very small, which is, I think that we need to learn how to recognize um, that, and this ties into something Jill was saying earlier, that one can talk about Zionism and one can talk about, um, you know, some of these ideas of a, a kind of non-political sense, maybe, of, of what, you know, a, a certain conception of Israel might be, and, and sort of define those and talk about those. And we also have to be able to talk about Israel as a political entity. And I think that, um, you know, Jewish organizations in the United States that are trying to respond to what's going on now with this new government um, need to be aware that when they're talking about Israel as a political entity, um, it's not useful or helpful to just try to kind of conflate some of these other kinds of conceptions, you know, whether it's the sort of liturgical Zionism or kind of a, a peoplehood based Zionism with the political entity. And if you're going to talk about Israel as it exists today, as a state that has policies and that has leaders, you need to be able to talk about its political actions. And, you know, I think that in the United States, 
Um, certainly among American Jewish organizations, there has been this kind of history of trying to depoliticize things that are actually quite explicitly political. And I don't think that's going to be helpful in this case. I think that there needs to be a sort of frank recognition of talking about the, the kind of political situation and accepting that that does not necessarily have to invalidate some of the other ways that one might want to name their Zionism or name their Jewish peoplehood or whatever it might be. Um, so I think that that's just, you know, even more important. I think it's always important, but I think that this situation is making quite clear that that's important. I would just say, the first thing I worry about is that <clears throat> what's happening with Ben Gavir and Smotrich is that essentially a kind of, that, that because their racism is so spectacular, it's blinding us to the fact that, um, that, that racism and Jewish supremacy are, are normalized in Israel. Israel in, in also what we would consider the center, even center left. It wasn't uh, uh, Betzalel Smotrich and Ben Gavir who, who have been bulldozing um, the villages in Masafar Yata, leading, leaving potentially thousands of people homeless in what can only be described as a war crime. That's on your Lear Lapid and Benny Gantz's head, right? It's not yet, it's not Betz, it's not uh, Ben Gavir who just said to Jordan Peterson that the land was barren, that there were no people until the Zionists came in the late 19th century, and that if there were any Arabs there, they were basically unsivilized people who didn't deserve the land because they hadn't done anything with it and a kind of a, a, a kind of you know 19th century kind of style racist that was Benjamin Netanyahu and he's been saying that by the way his entire his entire adult life um what I worry about is that what we have a group of American Jewish organizations and I specifically call out the anti-defamation League which are essentially uninterested in what happens on the ground in Israel Palestine they're, 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 what their their only focus is on anti-Semitism and on the and, and particularly on the equation of anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. So because they're not interested in what happens on the ground, because that's uncomfortable for them to deal with, um, what you have is a situation in which people who in the United States say, well, Zionism looks racist to me, um, who are responding to the actual actions of the Israeli government, that those people are only engaged as anti people trafficking anti-Semitism without a conversation about what they're actually responding to on the ground, right? Um, it seems to me if you're gonna have a conversation about Zionism uh, and, and, to, and when it, it, it shades into anti-Semitism, anti, anti, anti -Semitism, you have to involve, that conversation has to be involved as Lila was saying, not about Zionism as some kind of abstract ideal the kind of Zionism that I might identify with, or the Zionism of Judah Magnus and, and Martin Buber, but Zionism as practiced by the state of Israel right now. And if you don't engage in that, your conversation about the relationship between anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism in the United States is going to be profoundly misguided. And I think this is not an accident. I don't think that most major American Jewish organizations want to look carefully at what at how Zionism actually expresses itself on the ground in the lives of Palestinians because it would be too uncomfortable to them. And that's because, and I'll end here, fundamentally, I think our most powerful organizations in our community are not fighting against anti-Zionism in the name of Jewish equality as they should be. They are essentially fighting against anti-Zionism in the name of Jewish supremacy. That much of their the anti, what they're fighting against in terms of anti-Zionism is actually not the defense of Jews as be, having the right to be treated equally with other people, but the right of Jews to have rights that are above other people, uh, Palestinians. And that I think is the root of a lot of the problem. I would like to thank our audience for being with us. I'd like to thank you, Jill Jacobs, Laila Cohen Berman, Peter Beinart. I think we have some answers and also some questions. I'm not going to solve it now. Thank you so much and good day. <laughs>